morning, everybody. I want to welcome you here this morning. Glad you're with us. I'm Andy. I'm one of the, the guys on staff. I'm just grateful to have you here and let you invite me into your living room. It's just, it really is an honor. It all sort of feels surreal, doesn't it? I mean, we're trying to all put the best foot on it, but it just feels like kind of a weird deal. You're having church from your living room. You're, you may be in your pajamas or real casual hanging out together. You, you've got the little communion set there on your table. I've seen some of those, by the way. Those are real cute. If you want to snap a picture of that, we'd love to see that. You can put that in your comments. Um, but I'm standing here in almost an empty room. You know, uh, Nick and Greg are here kind of running things. Uh, Nick, by the way, uh, Nick Patton, if you don't realize it, he's literally made so many things happen over these last seven or eight weeks with the quarantine. I mean, right now he's here today, but most of the time he's been uh, in Nashville running things from his house, broadcasting my words in his service from his house in Nashville all around the world. Like our, our, our grandparents would have no idea what I just said. Like that, that would make no sense to them uh, whatsoever, broadcasting the service in Spring Hill from his house in Nashville around the world. Uh, he, he was there also, by the way, overseeing, you know, like nuclear codes and deciphering CIA passwords and all that kind of stuff. So if there's a glitch this morning in the feed, it's not because of anything on your end, probably not anything on our end. It is probably because there's a political uprising in Ukraine or something and Nick's had to do something. I don't know. So don't worry about that. If that happens, if, if you're friends with him, by the way, on Facebook or even just in the feed, I'd love for you to tell him thank you for literally hours and hours and hours of time he's put in to allow us to keep doing what we're doing in a way that works even during this surreal time. I really would appreciate uh, that. Uh, by the way, this is funny. I, I didn't want him to know I was going to talk about him, and he didn't until just right now. Uh, but I shared my message with him because he would use that in Nashville to switch the cameras. I mean, he switched the cameras and angles from his house. And anyway, so I didn't want him to see that. So I had to create a separate document that put the notes that I wanted to say about him in it and then share with him the other one that didn't have the notes, but he probably hacked my computer. So the joke's all on me anyway. Anyway, that's all fine. So I wanted you to say thanks to him. It all feels, sort of feels surreal what we're doing, but I want you to know that what we're doing is very much real. I mean, more people are participating in our services now than when we were just meeting in in person before the quarantine. You know, we have new friends with us. Someone from the Wellspring family has invited you, and we're so glad that you're with us. And you're worshiping uh, from here in the Spring Hill area or in the Middle Tennessee area, maybe further away than you would drive to Spring Hill, or people from all over the country. We have people watching from the West Coast and the East Coast, from the Midwest, literally all over the place are watching this service. Uh, our offerings are up. Thank you, by the way, for that. I was on a conference call this past week with a bunch of pastors, and some churches are facing steep budget cuts, considering laying off people and, and, and really addressing how to handle things. Our offerings are actually up during this quarantine. In addition to that, uh, thousands of dollars have been given by you guys to help needs of people in our community. The Well Outreach has received quite a bit of money through Wellspring. Jetpacks, blessing bags, benevolence, all have received significant donations. And that's because of your generosity and your faith that says you're... you're you're being supplied for not by the economy or by your employment even, but by the God in heaven who provides all things. And so your faith is on display in this key moment. And I just want to say thank you to, to you for that, um, which is really cool. So our participation is up, offerings are up. Uh, yesterday, we had our ninth baptism during the quarantine period. Isn't that crazy? Nine baptisms? And right after that, yesterday, we also had our 10th and our 11th baptism during the quarantine our 11th baptism during the quarantine. So I know you're as eager as I am to get back to, to normal, whatever that's going to look like, and meeting here in person and all of that. And, and I want you to know we, we've, been saying, we've been saying to you that our in-person services have stopped, but our mission still continues. And that feels a little forced or something. Uh, it's, you may think it's just talk. It's not. The mission of God is marching forward, and we're going to come out of this thing advancing, not pulling back or retreating. You know, we're watching all the guidance from the federal and state officials and health people about how to re-enter uh, with phase one starting next week. And then phase two and three after that, Governor Lee is scheduled to give guidance to churches specifically this coming week. We're going to be paying real close attention to that. Also this week, we'll be meeting um, along with the pastors from Thompson Station Church, the Church of Station Hill and the Bridge. We're going to be meeting with Spring Hill's mayor and city administrator about their thoughts 
That comes on Tuesday, so pray for that meeting, if you will, on Tuesday. We want to keep everyone safe, but we also want to keep moving with the mission of God. So let me just, let me just tell you, let me just tell you, I've been preaching to this silly camera for seven weeks. So when we all get back together, I don't care if it's funny or not, you better laugh. Because if you don't, I'm going to go back to the quarantine. We'll be the only church in the nation quarantining. I don't care. You better laugh even if it's not funny. Anyway, serious prayer request. One of our goals coming out of this thing that I need you to help me with. So before the quarantine, we did church here in this building in Spring Hill. And then now this went away and now we're having a church online in uh, kind of an online campus model, if you will. We're, we've gotten a little better at how we do that. What we don't want to do is shut this down to start this again. We want to figure out how to do both. Because again, some of the people that we're connecting with, some of you that now are part of the Wellspring family, don't live right down the street. You live across the state or out of state. And we're trying to figure out how to do both. So if you could be praying about that, I really would appreciate, I really would appreciate your prayers and covet those over these next days. You know, one of the things I really appreciate about the Bible is just the honest candor um, that the Bible brings. You know, if I was writing a fictitious story about some made-up deity, I would have his people always listen, and they would always obey, and they would never doubt, and they would never go the other direction. And the Bible is full of times where people question God, or they doubt God, or they, they second-guess his words. And that's helpful for me, because sometimes I have doubts, or questions, or objections. Sometimes my faith feels smaller than my fears do. And so when that's true, it's helpful for me to see that that's always been true of the people of God. The Bible's chocked full of examples of people's when their faith was, was doubting. Jonah was disappointed when God didn't destroy Nineveh, and the Bible records that. Elijah went through a drought and a showdown with the prophets of Baal, and then he was rewarded by having King Ahab threaten his life. And that one more thing was the last straw. He was mad at God. Have you had a one more thing kind of moment recently? I mean, what was the last straw that pushed you over the edge? Abraham was upset that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, even though his nephew Lot lived right there. And he pled with God. He said in Genesis 18, Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is right? Do you ever wonder if God's doing what's right? Do you ever have that question? Like in your mind, there's a, a clear choice, a right answer, and God doesn't seem to be choosing correctly as you see it? If you've ever found yourself mad at God or disappointed with his decisions or confused by his actions or inactions, then this message is exactly for you. You know, maybe the events of the last few weeks have led you to a place where you're wrestling with faith. You have a lot of anxiety or fear. Maybe you've, you've lost your job and you're not sure where the next paycheck's coming from. Or maybe you've, you've seen your retirement savings evaporate with the, the stock market roller coaster that it's been on. Or maybe you're wondering why an all-powerful God would allow a virus to, to wreak such havoc on the world. If that's you, then today's message is for you. Today's passage comes out of a, a day in the life of Jesus from Luke chapter 7. And we're going to read some of those verses. I'll put them on the screen, but you can look at all of Luke 7 later to get some surrounding detail. It starts in verse 18 with John the Baptist is in jail, and he sends a couple of his friends, a couple of his disciples, to go to Jesus to tell him, to find out what's going on. And they come back and report to John. And John seven eighteen a says, John's disciples told him about all these things. Now, all these things that they saw with Jesus were healings and miracles and people raised from the dead. It was powerful stuff happening. And it says, John's disciples told him about all these things and calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord and said, are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? Now, now John knew Jesus. He was related to Jesus. They were very likely cousins. He baptized Jesus. His whole life was prophesied to be a forerunner for Jesus. But now he's asking, are you the one? Like prison made him question everything. He got up inside of his own head like a lot of us do. And he began to doubt and he began to fear and he began to worry. And he began to say, well, if this is true, then this can't be true. And if this is right, then that has to be wrong. And he got all up inside his head. Are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? Because I think he was saying, when I thought about the one who was to come, the one I imagined would be one who would get his dear old cousin out of jail. And you've not done that. So maybe there's another one coming. Maybe we missed it. It goes on in verse 21. It says, At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. 
So he replied to the messengers, John's friends, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is, is proclaimed to the poor. Luke starts by saying at that very time, he's being very clear here that Jesus is picking and choosing what miracles he's going to perform in a way that's confusing to John and very likely is confusing to us sometimes. I mean, you've got to get this picture. If you look in Luke 7, Jesus is healing people. He's casting out demons. He raises a little boy back to life and gives him back to his mom. He's doing that for the crowds of people in front of him. And he even does that for a messenger who sends from a distance a healing off-site, if you will. So John is in jail. He's afraid for his life. He sends messengers from a distance. And they walk up to Jesus as Jesus is touching and healing and, and casting out demons and loving on people. And they say, hey, what you're doing for them and what you've done for people from a distance, can you do that miraculous thing for John from a distance? He's in jail. You may have forgotten about him because you've not gotten him out, which clearly you could do that. And during the whole conversation, Jesus is healing people. As he's not doing for John what John wants, he's doing it for other people and showing John's friends that he could do it for John if he chose to. Jesus didn't forget about John in jail. He just didn't choose to get him out. And we really don't know why. And all these years later, we still don't really know why. I mean, why in the world would Jesus not do that? What good answer can you think of that would make you say, well, Jesus didn't do it because of this or that. I'm sure John was praying. I'm sure his followers were praying. He was a godly man full of faith. In fact, right after John's friends left, Jesus turns to the crowd and talks about John and says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. So why didn't Jesus just say, John, be free, and the prison walls could evaporate or open up or the guards could turn and let him out? I mean, if you look earlier in, in Luke 7, a man actually sends servants to Jesus and says, I'm not worthy to come talk to you. Can you heal my servant? And don't bother coming to me. You can just give the word and he'll be healed from a distance. And Jesus gave the word and he was healed from a distance. So like, why couldn't Jesus from a distance even say, all right, I'm busy here healing and touching and, and loving people, teaching. I can't come to John right now, but John, you, you be free. I mean, he could have done it. Why didn't he just proclaim it? We don't know. He doesn't tell us. And he seems to know that this is going to cause a crisis of faith for John and maybe a crisis of faith for John's friends and others and maybe one day for us when Jesus doesn't follow our script. It's like he knows what he's doing. Because in verse 23 it says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Translation, I know this is going to be confusing for you. I know that you may have doubts and fears that my inaction may not fix. And you're just going to have to trust me. And there's lots of times, friends, if we're going to walk by faith, there's going to be a lot of times we're just going to have to trust God. Psalms 56.3 says, When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Some of you are going to need to memorize this verse right here. Write it down. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your computer screen. Put it on the, the steering wheel of your car. Because you're going to need to remember, when I'm afraid, I'm going to trust God. My bills are piling up. I don't know how I'm going to ever pay them. When I'm afraid, I'm going to put my trust in you. Or my marriage is a mess, and this quarantine's not helping, and I don't have any idea how it's going to get better. When I'm afraid, I'm going to put my trust in you. Or I'm alone and isolated. It's leading me to some pretty dark places. I'm getting all up inside of my head. When I'm afraid, I'm going to put my trust in you. And Jesus says, John, I know this doesn't make any sense. I know you don't understand why I'm not getting you out of jail. You're just going to have to trust me. Have you ever played the game Boggle? I don't know if you've done this at home or not. Um, it's kind of like Yahtzee, but with letters. And so you shake up this, this group of letters and you pour it out on the table and you've got a certain amount of time to try to figure out words that come out of these rambled, this uh, random scrambled uh, collection of letters. And sometimes you see a word immediately. Like, oh, there's, there's a word. Sometimes you don't see it to start with, but then you see it. Other times, other people at your table may see it, but you go the whole round and you can't see the word that everyone else seems to see. And sometimes you and I can wonder for 2,000 years, why in the world would Jesus not free John? And we may never know this side of heaven, why Jesus chose to, to do for some and not for others when he could have done for both. When we're disappointed with God or when we doubt his decisions, I think it's often 
centered around a misunderstanding about life and a misunderstanding about God. So I want to take a few moments for the remainder of the message to talk about some of those misunderstandings because I think some of you may be wrestling with them right now. Some of them I wrestle with on occasion. And this may help us clear up some things about what's going on right now. Like it gives us a new filter. You know, when, you, when your glasses are dirty, everything's messed up. And when we have these misconceptions about God or life, it's the filter we see everything through. And so we need to get this right so we can see clearly what God's up to in the world. Misconception number one is that the world is not broken. That the world is not broken. It is broken. Jesus tells us in Revelation 21 that one day he's going to restore all things. And in that day, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away. But friends, today is not that day. Dawson McAllister says the main reason we get mad at God is because we think he owes us something, usually to give us things we want or to protect us from things we don't want. And sometimes when we're mad at God, when we're disappointed, it's because we've forgotten that this world is not our home. We're just guests who are passing through. I mean, look at, the, look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we now have this light shining in our hearts, the gospel, but we ourselves are like fragile clay pot jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from us. You know, one of the most shocking parts to me about this whole situation has been the fragility of our world. Two months ago, two months ago, you would have never believed what would have transpired over these last weeks. Our entire world is shut down because of a virus that came out of a, a research lab in China. I mean, the, most, the largest disruption since World War II, certainly the largest disruption of my lifetime, came in a matter of days, even really hours. All of our economy, all of our certainty, all of our security, lots of our money, gone in a matter of days and hours. We are indeed like fragile clay jars. 2 Corinthians 4 continues, says, We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but not, never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. I, I want you to notice the language here. It's like there's an outward strength, and then there's an inward strength. Do you see that? And which one of those two strengths fail us? You know, over the last two months, we've lost almost all of our outward strength. But in the process, many of us are discovering or rediscovering an inward strength that has been available to us all along. We've admittedly allowed our faith to grow dormant. We've admittedly been distracted or deceived by the outward signs of strength that never really were there, but we always thought they were there. They weren't. We're fragile. Just a few verses later, Paul wraps it up by saying, Therefore, in response to all of that, we do not lose heart. That's on the inside. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. The strength that matters most is on the inside. And that strength is from God. We're being renewed. We didn't renew ourselves. We're being renewed because God is the one who gives us that strength on the inside where it counts the most. John Orberg once said, Any crisis carries in its wake the question, What can I build my life on that circumstances cannot rob me of? What really matters? You know, we live in a broken world, far too broken to serve as a foundation for anything, let alone our whole life. If you build your life on anything in this world, it's going to fail you. If you build your life on your career, it'll eventually let you down. I mean, over 20 million people have filed for unemployment in the last month. If you build your life on relationships in this broken world, it's going to let you down. Many of the people that you've loved and cared for and depended upon, now you're isolated from and you're, you're, you're social distancing. If you build your life on your health or your finances or your family, they're eventually all going to let you down. For this world is broken and passing away, but this world is not our home. Only God is strong enough. Only God is strong enough to be a foundation for your life. Because we're too fragile without him. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. If you're accurately feeling the fragility that's been there all along, then come to God. Draw near to God. Prioritize spiritual things. Take a moment to pray. Some of you haven't prayed in 
a long, long time. Take a moment to pray. Listen to some worship songs. Read your Bible. Draw near to God, and God will come near to you, and you'll find that inner strength that's been available all along. Now, I like the next part of this verse. It just kind of make, made me chuckle. Next part of this verse says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Pretty good coronavirus uh, prescription. Wash your hands, get your heart right. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good one-two punch. You, know, you and I struggle because we think the world is not broken. We also struggle because we, we think we should always understand. God should always act in a way that makes sense to me. I don't know if you've noticed one of the, the side positive benefits of this whole COVID-19 business is that the election has kind of taken a back seat. Anybody else notice that? It's kind of been a welcome respite, like a lot of the politics has kind of taken a back seat. But in elections, what we try to do, it's always imperfect, but we try to find someone who believes as we believe, who thinks the way we think, so that we can give them the power that we don't have, so that they can carry the responsibility that we don't want. That's democracy. But God is not the head of a democracy. You can't vote for God. He's not running to be our president. He declares himself to be our king. And we can accept that or we can reject it, but it doesn't change the reality of who he is. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of all lords. And I so appreciate John the Baptist's honest words we read just a minute ago. Are you the one who's to come or should we be looking for somebody else? Have you ever felt that way? Like God's not doing what you thought he should be doing. Like what he did or didn't do just doesn't make sense to me. And now what am I going to do? Because God's not fitting in the box that I had figured out for him to sit in. It's in moments like this when you don't understand, when it's not clear, when you feel extra fragile. It's in moments like this that you've got to put more trust in God. And trust forged in these dark moments will carry us through a lifetime of uncertainty and doubt. Ernest Hemingway once said, sooner or later, the world breaks everyone and those who are broken are strongest in the broken places. God doesn't always follow our plans and we don't always understand. And that's completely okay with him. And it's got to increasingly become okay with us. A third misunderstanding. This one is maybe the most common but it's one that you're going to be the least likely to admit, at least not out loud. So I want to warn you, when I give you this third one, your first reaction is going to be to say, well, that, that doesn't apply to me. Because even though it's the most common, I think it's probably the one that we're the hardest, most remiss to accept. The third misunderstanding is that God cannot be trusted. You know, Satan's not all that creative. Look throughout the pages of Scripture. At the root of Satan's lies is a steady refrain that you cannot trust God. You cannot trust God. You cannot trust God. He appears to Adam and Eve and says that God was wrong about that fruit tree. You can't trust him. He told Sarah she, that God would never give her a baby. You can't trust him. He told Gideon that God wasn't nearly strong enough to protect his small little group against such a large army. You can't trust him. And I don't know what example he's trying to sell you, but I promise you at the root of it is a sense that you cannot trust God. And yet you can. Listen to these reassuring words from David. I think you got to cling to these in the midst of our doubt. Psalm 66 says, come and see what our God has done. What awesome miracles he performs for people. Our lives are in his hands and he keeps our feet from stumbling. You have tested us, O God. You have purified us like silver. We went through fire and flood, but you brought us to a place of great abundance. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. God's purifying us right now, friends. Don't miss this moment because God is using this moment to purify his church. He's taking us through fire and flood. And when he brings us through, and he's going to bring us through, and when he brings us through, then you can know that God can be trusted because even when the whole world shuts down, God is still there and still moving and still active. You know, if you've been through a few of these before, not global pandemics, none of us have had that, but if you've been through crises where God has seen you through, then you know what I'm saying is right. If you're newer to faith, then take it from a guy who's been around a while, that God can be trusted. And he's going to see you through this moment, even if you lost your job, even if you're concerned about your health, even if you don't know where the, the economy or the future or the politicians are going to take us, God can be trusted. And he'll see you through. In 1975, I saw this great story 
A Jesuit philosopher, John Cavanaugh, was searching for answers to some of life's, life's most compel compelling problems. And so he decided to go to, to Calcutta, India, to spend some time with Mother Teresa. His first morning there, he wakes up, goes outside, and, and almost immediately runs into Mother Teresa. And she asks him, she's like, what can I do for you? And he said, I want you to pray for me. She says, well, what can I pray for? I'd love to pray for you. What can I pray for you? And he said, I, the reason I've come to India, I want you to pray that I could find some clarity. And Mother Teresa says, no. I mean, how do you say no to a prayer? She said, I'm not going to do it. He said, what do you mean no? And she says, clarity is the last thing you're clinging to and the idol you must let go of. And Kevin will say, wait a minute, that's, that's not true. He said, you, you always seem to have such clarity. And she laughed and she said, I've never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you learn to trust God. And that's us, friends. So many of us are struggling today because we thought we had clarity. We thought we had certainty. We maybe even thought we had some control. But all of those have been pried out of our hands. And what was left in the vacuum, we realized that we never had any of those things. But we've always had access to an inner strength from God, being renewed day by day, that comes from having peace with God. Look at this first out of Romans 5. I want to use this to kind of wrap up. Romans 5 says, therefore, since we've been justified through our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Because of what Jesus has done, you have access to God. I have access to God. And we have the promise that we read just a moment ago that if you draw near to God, if I draw near to God, he will in turn draw near to us. And that peace with God is an inner strength that's powerful. A faith that we need to rediscover or, or maybe discover for the first time. Verse 3 continues. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. You, know, you cannot face the adversity we're facing today without, without having peace of God on the inside. The, the outward struggles will just crush you. But if on the inside you've got peace with God, if on the inside you're being renewed by him day by day, then all of that outside stuff takes its proper perspective. You'll, you'll know that those outside things will not crush you. They'll build perseverance in you. They won't make you weak. They'll make you strong. They'll build your character and your hope. And that is why Wellspring exists. That's why we do what we do, so that, so that you can have peace with God to help you find the peace that your soul longs for. You know, if you've never declared to God that you want him to be the leader of your life. I want you to do that today. If you've been living your life, uh, even though you know him, you've been living your life as if he's not your leader. I want you to say to God today, right there in your living room, God, I, I want you to lead again my life. I need to rediscover my faith. If you've never asked Jesus to, declare, to save you from your sins, to be your savior, I, I want to ask that you do that. And I'm going to ask you right where you are to to ask God to be the leader of your life and to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to ask you to pledge your life to God in baptism. Now, I know that some of you have kind of sensed that you've needed to do that for a while. You, you've kind of known that that was something you needed to do, but your inner attorney has talked you out of it. You're like, I don't want everybody to have to wait on me while, while they are ready to go to lunch, or I don't want to do that in front of a big crowd, or I, don't want to, I didn't bring clothes with me, I'm, so I'm sitting here in the seat, feel like I need to do that, but I don't have dry clothes. I don't... Listen, all of these things are, are covered today, right? You're not going to a restaurant anyway. No one's here but me and Keith and Emily. No one else is here. And, and you're at your house where the clothes are, so you can grab them and come here. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, send a message saying, wait on me. I'm coming, and we'll wait on you, and we'll be here to, to receive you and baptize you when you get here. Or you can text the word RESPOND to 615-433-5152, and, and we'll do that. Now, I understand that some of you are watching this on Sunday morning, and so we'll wait on you. Some of you are watching this on a, a Tuesday afternoon or a Thursday night or sometime later. I want you to know this offer is still available to you, even six months from now. 
If you're watching this message and you want to uh, be baptized, text this number and we'll get back to you and we'll set up a time. We'll meet you over here and we'll, we'll baptize you. You say, well, what if it's midnight? Hey, I'm game if you're game. You text us and let us know. Now, I'm, I am old, so I may not hear the text. So if you text that number and no one responds, don't start driving until someone responds with you because I may not have woken up when you texted. But listen, all the excuses are gone. All the rationales of why I need to do this and God's calling me to do this, but I'm not sure I'm ready. To, all of that stuff has been covered for. And today's a day for you to rediscover faith or discover it for the first time. To say all of that outside stuff is, is going to crush me if I don't change something in here. If I don't have peace with God, I can never have peace with the stuff going on around me. And all of that disruption, all of that, all of that problem is going to be worth it if God uses this season to grab your heart. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Let's pray. God, I, I ask right now that even though we're not all together in one room, we're not even in all one city or state, I ask, God, that you, through the power of your Spirit, would draw people to your Son, that you would draw us close to you, that we would discover or rediscover our faith that we've allowed to grow dormant. And we would not be crushed on the outside by all of these outside concerns because we found peace with you on the inside. And you're renewing us day by day. God, for those who are your followers, I pray that you would begin to renew us, spark a sense of hope and calm and peace and assurance in the middle of these trying times. God, for those who have never given their life to you or for those who are uh, walking and living as if they've not, I pray that today would be a, a, a day they return to you. They would draw near to you and you would draw near to them. God, I pray that today would be a day that, that multiple people Right now, get up and say, I, I need to do that. I've been, been needed to for quite a while, and I need to do it today. And we would see uh, person after person pledge themselves to you, their faith renewed and restored during these trying, surreal times. Help us, God, to rediscover our faith. In the name of Jesus.